Thank you, Claudio. Can everybody hear us? Okay. Okay, volume-wise, I hope. Um, thank you for coming. Those of you who have been to some of my talks in the past might have noticed that we've done a lot of talking about the big, high-end, multi-million dollar art market. And while that might be up to 50% of the volume of business, there's a big, huge, important rest of the art market. And it's becoming more and more important to try to talk about what's going on there. So that's hence this, this topic. So um, I invited our two panelists who are going to introduce themselves to you. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you introduce Ed? Okay. Um, this is Ed Winkleman, uh, a gallerist in New York, my friend and colleague, uh, and also the co-founder of Moving Image, which is a really interesting art fair platform uh, that takes place in New York and London that is devoted solely to new media. And this is Elizabeth D, uh, proprietor of the Elizabeth D Gallery in New York as well, uh, the founder of the X Initiative, which if you missed it, the year that it happened in New York uh, was perhaps one of the most groundbreaking and, and innovative and important things that happened in New York since the recession, as well as the co-founder of The Independent, which is an alternative to the art fair model. And again, uh, so excellent that I think it's changing the way people think about the art fairs in general. So, and of course, a dear friend of mine. So I thought we should dive right into the subject, you know, as dead on. And when we, when we talked about it, it seems like, well, first, what is a mid-level or mid-tier gallery? Um, how do we define it? And uh, are you one? Are you one? So whoever wants to get started and we'll sort of see where we get to from all this. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I think the first question is how to define a mid, a mid level gallery. And uh, the way I would define it, broadly speaking, is it's really, it's really about, um, it's, art, it's gallerists that have worked in a generational context who have brought on, at least for my generation, uh, who have introduced or have actually discovered, developed, and introduced artists that would not be known to the public otherwise. Uh, that can be emerging artists, typically. That's often how, how I began, and mm -hmm. I think how, Ed, you began. Yeah. Um, but then it also extends to mid-career artists. It also extends to what I call emancipation projects, which is redefining or introducing artists from older generations, more senior artists. Um, so in that context, that's how I define a mid-career gallery, and I would certainly say I, I definitely am one. Yeah. Yeah. No, Ed? I, I, I would definitely be considered a mid-level gallery as well. And I think you can kind of also distinguish a mid-level gallery from either the mega gallery or the emerging gallery. I think if people are mm -hmm. asking whether or not you're a mega, mega gallery, you're probably not a mega gallery if they're asking. And emerging galleries versus mid-level galleries, to be honest, I think um, one of the distinctions is sort of longevity, being around for a while. But I think there's also just a change in uh, your, your attitude about what it is to be a dealer that distinguishes you as a mid-level gallery as well. I think, you know, you and I have talked and we've talked a lot about the romance of starting a gallery and doing it in sort of the Leo Castelli model. And I think you become a mid-level gallery when you realize that even Leo Castelli's gallery wasn't what its mythology is, that there is a aspect to this of running a business that isn't necessarily romantic or fun, but important. And I think that awakening is one of the things that distinguishes a mid-level gallery as well. Is there a, another level in there that's in between? There's like that you could call the top level gallery that's not necessarily mega. And if so, do you aspire to maybe not be a mega gallery, but do you aspire to be a top gallery? And are these terms useful or not? Well, how would you define a mega gallery? I would, uh, mega gallery would seem to be to be a gallery that had either so many spaces or so many artists or so many directors that you can't really identify it as a mom and pop shop. Okay. And that I would say a lot of the top level galleries 
you still walk in there and for the sake of argument, there's Marion Goodman sitting there okay. and you identify it with her rather than 40 salespeople in 20 locations that way. So um, that's, that's how mm -hmm. I would distinguish it. So is your aspiration to be a, a top tier or a mega or stay in this mid zone? Our aspiration would be to, come, to become top tier, but not mega. Um, I, I think I share that, yeah. but I, I see it as a much more complex uh, agenda right now, because with the time that we're living in is, is very um, transitional. So I think what it means to be a top gallery, a top tier gallery for our generation will be very different than mm -hmm. from Marion Goodman's generation. Um, who makes, who gets to make that decision? The, uh, the artists, <laughs> the collectors, the museums, or the art fair selection committees? Who, who, who's who decided, becomes a top tier, do you mean? Who, who decides who's mega, who's top, who's top, who's emerging? I mean. It means different things for different people. Uh, I think, you know, Definitely the art fair selection committee situation reinforces and often legitimizes uh, uh, what I call a vertical hierarchy. Um, I don't see our generation working in a vertical hierarchy. I see our generation working in a horizontal hierarchy. Um, you know, Could you explain that a little bit better? I think growing top bottom is only one path forward. Uh, having the large space, the large staff, the specialized staff, having a more executive operation. That professionalism is, is more of a narrative arc that we've seen in the last 20 years. Um, I would certainly say, from my perspective, um, coming through the recession, and, which was really significant for our generation, um, yeah. not having that level of capitalization at our fingertips as a business, um, we've had to be more creative. And for me, that's meant more collaboration with my colleagues. Um, X Initiative, which I started to deal with the significance of the recession collectively, uh, was, was the first time I ever really moved into a more lateral growth of my work as a gallerist. Um, and then Independent, the Art Fair, which I think of as, a, as much a brain trust of the mid-level gallery uh, as it is an art fair platform um, also was a part of extending that work for, for myself. It wasn't about going from a 3,000 square foot space that I have in New York to a 10,000 square foot space. Um, a, that wasn't possible economically, but B, it wasn't as interesting uh, in terms of how to grow as a person and a professional in, in the art world. No, I think that's a should be considered a very valid choice to not necessarily have to open up 16 spaces around the world, but instead to yeah. sort of go horizontally. Um, for us as well, opening the Moving Image Art Fair was a choice to kind of do something a little outside of our gallery space that we felt was sort of important, but it was very difficult to do inside our gallery space. So, um, I mean, often building an artist from an emerging point to a place where they're performing well at auction, uh, you know, at a multiple of what they would be selling for in the gallery is, is a colleague-based uh, strategic plan that you have as a joint venture with the artist. So, you know, like, you know, we have artists where we have four European galleries. We have regular discussions about... Um, about museum shows, curatorial opportunities, collector opportunities. It's a very open discussion, um, and it's very much built by the network of the gallery behind the artist. And I think that that is a different way of approaching it. Having worked at mega galleries myself before I started my own gallery, it was clear to me that my path was going to be more about collaboration. Um, and you know, not to say that the space doesn't you know, evolve out of that um, at some point as the gallery grows and evolves yeah. with, the, with the market trends. But uh, it's really, there's growth that happens in terms of outreach and working on an international level with artists that our generation has been able to do without um, having to necessarily fall exactly in footsteps with the, our older predecessors. Yeah, and get back to your question specifically, I think whether you become a top tier gallery is something that the rest of the art world has a say in, the art fair selections and yeah. sort of you know, the response to your program. I think whether you become a mega gallery is your own choice. 
So you can't exist as a top tier gallery like Marianne Goodman without necessarily having to open five or six spaces. So that becomes her own personal business choice. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And don't you wind up being a victim of your own success though? I mean, this is all sounding very uh, utopian and we'll all get together and we'll all plan this and yeah. everybody's in this together. And suddenly there's a lot of money there. Does that then, you, you know, the better you do it, are you all almost like cannibalizing yourselves? And if you don't get too successful, you can keep going on this nice thing. If, you know, if you have a hit record, it puts record companies out of business or a hit book puts book publishers out of business. Is that like in the back of your mind or you just sort of ignore it? Well, we were talking this morning at breakfast that it's already happening yeah. before the money actually becomes a major factor. Um, uh, we were discussing emerging galleries uh, who are feeling frustrated because if they're successful as an emerging gallery, they're getting invited to be in all the top art fairs. And as a result, they are running from one city to the other, uh, producing you know, four-day exhibitions in this event culture, which is driving their business. And they don't have time to go to the artist studios anymore. So already you are operating like some kind of you know, mini CEO, and you have no staff to really assist. You, you have artists that need you, your time in the studio. You need the time for reflection and critique. You need time to work on the program. And, and that's being compromised by the demands of the event culture system, which is driving the economics of the gallery's evolution. And so I think that, that those dilemmas happen f earlier now than I think they used to. So, and then there's another level where you actually become fiscally successful with a group of artists, and then you have the, do I, do I leverage this into the next, um, you know, the next gallery chapter, and what does that gallery chapter look like? And I think that that's the other dilemma, but I think what needs to be understood is the first dilemma, which is just coming into a global system as a gallery with four employees. How do you, how do you manage that when you're doing six fairs around the world, or 12 fairs? Right. I mean, and, and that becomes a, an, a first problem that has to be dealt with. And your way of dealing with that was to open more art fairs. So, <laughs> well, I mean, fair you, point. you see the paradoxes <laughs> in these people's lives. Yeah. It's, oh my God, it art is. fairs, and what do we do? Let's yeah. start an art fair. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that Moving Image is the art fair you don't have to attend That's to participate true. in. Okay. That's so, very true. Which was actually one yes. of the thoughts behind that. Yeah. Um, so, but I was also talking with an artist this morning who may be in the audience, but I won't point the artist out. And whenever I start to think about sort of challenges in the business, I always go back to Business 101. What are my clients' needs? And I have two sets of clients. I have collectors and I have artists. And so trying to figure out how to navigate this mega gallery arena, I'm thinking, what are my artists' needs? And so I asked this artist, what are your needs? And the artist said, I actually need my dealers to be in my studio more. Mm -hmm. And that's the catch-22. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to compete in this new environment and you're doing the fairs around the world that you are and traveling as much as you need to in order to be competitive, your time spent developing that dialogue with your artists gets smaller and smaller. And with Skype, you can uh, talk to somebody on a different continent, plan an entire exhibition, and it arrives, and the artist arrives just for the opening. But you miss that critical arc right. of development, production, um, critique. Uh, you know, you, you're not as equipped to articulate the ideas behind works. Uh, you are the proxy for the artist, and yet you've spent very little time together. Right. So and by definition, do you need to then keep the roster or stable, whatever bad word you want to use, of artists to what it was traditionally when I had a gallery, 10 to 15 was sort of the maximum that you could deal with because you had to speak to each one of them every day. Right. And now, in one of the ways I define these mega or top galleries, if you have 40, 50, 100 artists, that's an impossibility. So are the artists happy with that situation where I don't even want to talk to my dealer, I want to just do my stuff? Or is there a younger generation? Are they driving it where they want to talk to mom and dad every day? Or is this just different artists? Or is it a bigger I think it varies per artist. And I think um, as well, at a certain point, a lot of artists will develop a dialogue with curators around the world as well. And that can replace the initial dialogue they had with their dealer. So, um, but it's interesting to me that that is a critical point 
uh, the fact that the artists need the dialogue and trying to find a way to keep doing that as a mid-tier gallery is really tricky. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So is there, um, is there a way, you were talking about Skyping, is there a way that social media is going to change this whole dialogue maybe down the line of how people are communicating and how many places that you have and who your audience is when you get back away from the artist. Now, what do your clients want from you? Your clients, if they bought a piece for a thousand hours, would like to see that there's a show at MoMA and there's a show sure. here and you know, you're protecting them if they're at auction. Do they have a, a, your other group that you're servicing, so to speak, you talked about the artists. What about the clients? What do they want from you? They want access when they have time. You know, the problem is everyone is super busy. So you get into a, a position where, uh, you know, they want to see you at every single art fair they're going to, yeah. because that's their time to focus. And also with the, you know, the curatorial community is the same. They're so bogged down in the institution trying to, you know, get projects going and the demands on them are so great that when they can come to Basel for four days, they can get everything done. They can have, you know, I planned a retrospective with a, with a curator yesterday and an artist for four, in four hours. Right. And, you know, that's their time. That, I don't, that could never have happened um, otherwise. And, and you, you really feel that many of the museum shows that you sign up with with museums are actually only happening at the fairs. They're not happening in the studios. It used to be you would take a curator to a studio, you would talk, there would be an ongoing dialogue. Mm -hmm. You would encourage the artist to have their own direct relationship with the curator as well. Uh, on a you know on a creative level, and then eventually there would be a project that would emerge. That now is you know very much top down curator defining and picking often with the with the the gallerist's help, yeah. and then that moving directly into the production stage without a lot of discourse in between. So I think that you know we can't underestimate the global situation. It's here. It's now. It's not just discussion anymore, and yeah. also the power of event culture, biennials auctions and art fairs to drive all of this activity, both for the uh, market side and the curatorial side. I totally agree. And yeah. the theme that emerges every time we talk about any particular player's position here, whether it's the collectors or the dealers or the curators or the artists, is a lack of time. Yeah. A lack of time to kind of do things in the way that they used to be done. And so I think your question about social media becomes really critical the world's not going to slow down for us. We need to be more efficient in the way we use time. And I think collectors are very smartly using the art fairs as a way to, you know, catch up very quickly. What lacks in that, of course, is the time they have to go around to the galleries and visit the galleries mm -hmm. and to have more in-depth sort of conversations. Well, the time of contemplation. Right. You know, and you used to have to send out a, tr make a transparency Think about whether this person was worth your, your only transparency, put it in an envelope, <laughs> send it around the world, hope you get it back, and there's this time lag. So you're saying there was so much time, mm -hmm. and now it's like bing, send, bing, send. Exactly. And so theoretically, you should have more time because you're doing all this, but... But you're doing it no. like on a much larger scale across the board. You're doing it for hundreds of clients. As a, I mean, because you're not sending a transparency, you don't choose just one or two. You're sending the same images if it's not you know, something you've already arranged to a lot more clients than that. And, and also you have to be accountable to the artist. You know, the, the artist will say, who have you offered the work to? You better have a huge list of your top collectors. If you say, well, you know, back in, you know, back in Josh, your days as a gallerist, you know, if five collectors were the audience, potential key audience for an exhibition, maybe 10. Um, and those transparent, you had five or 10 transparencies to, to parcel out, to send FedEx with a two page letter about the significance of this art object. And then there was a discussion. And um, I'm very, I came from that time. I had the last year or two right before everything switched over. So I remember that uh, very vividly. And now, you know, if I, if I sat down with an artist and said, your show's fantastic, I've offered it to these five people, they would say, you're not doing your job. Uh, you know, so it's the how, expectations How many people in the audience are artists, by show of hands? Okay, so how many of you are uh, gallerists? Okay, 
pretty good. Any, anybody consider themselves a dealer and didn't raise their hand? Okay. <laughs> okay. And how many collectors? Okay. How many of you got lost on your way to something else? <laughs> a few of there. So there's a big range of, of needs yeah. of what people are trying to, to deal with this. Do you think that the, that the art world or the gallery business will look different now in 5, 10, or 50 years? And if so, what might it look like? If I had that crystal ball, I would sell that information. Um, we, we've talked a lot. I do sell that information on the bare facts. Fair enough. It's $200 a year. It's very clear. I have that information provided if you subscribe only. Fair Ed is a more you know, democratic guy who may or may not put it on his blog, which is actually. If I had that piece of information, I would not put it on the blog. OK. So, uh, but what it's going to look like, everybody's talking about that. And some of the themes that emerge are dealers. There's a bunch of chatter about the post brick and mortar era where you don't need to have a physical space, except then how do you participate in the art fairs? Because most of them require that. There's a fair bit of chat about sort of switching more to the entertainment model, where you as a dealer become either more like an agent or more like a manager. Then you have to go from 50% to 10%. Most dealers. Gowers don't want that model for that reason. <laughs> well, perhaps, but if you don't have the overhead, it's not such a big deal. I think, I think it's about a bifurcation system where certain gallerists are the platform and they're the cultural producers of the project. And then, so, you know, maybe get some gallerists leave the system uh, to work exclusively with artists who interface with that platform. So it's like the manager and, right, the, and the agent and the, yeah, exactly. Well, it's more and manager and then the production company or. Yeah, but um, I, I think you will attract a different type of person into those roles. And we, we've seen a number of high profile galleries close be, and the dealers, you know, they were not financially strapped. It's the business had evolved to a place where it wasn't interesting for them anymore. So I think you will see people who may have opened a gallery in the old model mm -hmm. choose not to sort of become mm -hmm. a dealer in the new model, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just you'll have a different group of people doing the agent model, I think. It just, there just has to be a significant uptick in the level of collaboration um, in order for you know, this generation to, to move forward in the way that it needs to for itself, for its own considerations and its own needs, um, which are different. Uh, we're in a different climate. Um, there, is, there has to be more with less, both time and money are factors in that. Um, and, and it really, there really has to be, we have to see some kind of evolution of the model because the model's just really not working. Um, it's, it's predominantly it's in, not yeah. working for artists. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the core. We keep yeah. coming back to that idea. Yeah. We're going to open to questions in a minute, but, but when you say it's not working for artists, I think you need to be more um, specific what, what you mean there. Okay, here's a couple examples. Um, in the interview we put online, we talked about one of the roles of a mid-level gallery is to support artists between those years when they've made a splash and they've gotten all the big press, but they haven't quite become blue chip yet. And those can be very frustrating years for a lot of artists. And um, the role of the mid-level gallery is to say, no, we're in this for the long run. We believe you're going to become blue chip. We're going to be there with you. And if artists don't necessarily believe that that's the way it's going to work anymore if they see that the way you get a, to your goals is to kind of keep moving from gallery to gallery or keep going up through the gallery field. You have less of that support. There won't be the motivation for the galleries to take the kind of risks they may have before because they don't necessarily believe the artists are going to hang around that long. So. I think the one way to appeal to the needs of the artist, um, and I think it's also something that is so important for, for us, is, is the issue of context. Um, you know, we're obsessed with that. Which you lose if you don't have your brick and mortar again. Right, so. and, and context is, is even more critical now than it ever was because yeah. there's just so much information that has to be sifted through and there's so much positioning that artists have to think about in their work, um, being in this larger playing field. Um, and then also with programmatically too. You see certain galleries that are you know, slightly older than us who have gone through a huge amount of change with their programs and have chosen to not 
evolve in a vertical hierarchy, but to really just further define their point of view contextually with their programs. And now they have a whole new generation of artists coming to them right. who are you know, clearly making that choice over other choices that are more traditional in nature about this upward mobilization. Um, because they want the context. They know it's significant. Um, it means something. But, well, let's open it up to questions from the audience if you're willing to um, say who you are and if you're willing to say if you're an artist or a collector or um, what have it. We have a, a microphone here. So is there anybody who's uh, willing to take the first in the back there? And I meant to say, and members of the press, I didn't we ask. We should have put our hands up exactly for that. Sorry, Melanie from the art newspaper. And hi, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, Ed, I didn't know if you could develop more, or, or both of you, this idea that if commissions did go down from 50% to 10%, you said maybe technology could help because it would cut costs. Do you think it could? I think the main costs, sa the main savings would be not having the rent and the overhead of a brick and mortar space. So um, I think you could definitely re-examine what your own personal needs are to be an artist agent or an artist manager and come up with something less than the 50%. And I think that would attract a lot of artists as well. The problem would be making sure that in the role of the agent or the manager, you're able to accomplish as much for your artists as you can from a physical space. So, um, but you still require a uh, uh, you still require a very expert team, yeah. depending on what the level of management is. So each artist has different needs and different projects they're embarking on. It's great p personally to play that role uh, in the initial stages of maybe. Yeah, but what is that manager doing? But don't you ultimately need to find them a show at another gallery that's going to be exactly. take, taking on those expenses and those yeah. commissions? You mean if you're working with an artist as like a solo agent and yeah. they don't have a gallery representation, do they eventually need to have a gallery? I think that's a really open question. I mean, to be honest... So maybe we don't need galleries in the same way. that We certainly will need museums. No question. We'll yeah. probably, I hate to say it, need auctions to provide the illusion of liquidity. Yeah. Art fairs and not so, maybe not, and maybe not galleries? It's hard to say. I mean, but the White Cube is less than 100 years old as a concept for presenting and selling art. So the idea that well, this is the only way that it can exist, I think is silly. Um, I don't, again, have the crystal ball. I don't know exactly what that new model looks like, but it may not require that you pay overhead on a space that we're seeing fewer and fewer people visit, and I've been talking to galleries around the world, they're all reporting, I mean some not necessarily, but a lot of galleries are reporting fewer visitors because of the art fairs. And we're seeing rents go up, so those two things are arguing against. But, but I think that the, the gallery is significant because as fewer collectors spend less time in the gallery and more time at the fair, mm -hmm. that, that leaves open the opportunity for the gallery to be reclaimed by the artist um, as their ultimate home for their work, for their project. Um, it's something that uh, can, it can be a, a, a laboratory for, yeah. for that. And, and it is important because if, if we eliminate that, um, then we're eliminating bodies of work being produced. Right. Instead, it's individual works going into individual locations to be in group show context. I think the audience now, when I'm in Chelsea, for the shows is other artists. And that's the audience that the shows yeah. are addressing. Right. And so on the one hand, you walk in Chelsea, you might think, well, there's no one there because there's no one then that I recognize that I've seen at all the art fairs or auctions. And I realize it's really artists mm -hmm. who are going in, in there that need the exhibitions to show it to other artists to that, that kind of dialogue. Right. And if you eliminated the bricks and mortar, you'd eliminate the experience of seeing art in the flesh right. to your peers. And for that reason, I would hope that this other model or these other ways of working may work personally, but um, we can't exist without it because you can't smell, see, touch, feel artwork. And as an artist, you need to see other art Absolutely. at some point. Mm -hmm. do, do we have another question here, I hope? We have a... 
Is that the press section? Or are you all stuck <laughs> in the corner and in the back again? I'm uh, Prem Krishnamurthy. I'm a curator, gallerist, and designer. I guess my question is that you talked about your two clients as being artists and collectors, and it feels to me like that cuts out whole other ranges of publics, because that seems like it would be the point of an exhibition is not only that it speaks to collectors and other artists, but also to other people who are interested in that and might have access to art and ideas in ways that would otherwise be closed off and travel through completely exclusive circuits? I think it's really, I, I don't see it as, as a binary system um, at all. I, I, I think what's interesting about this time is it gives us an opportunity to reflect on what is the gallery audience. Um, and I, I would say, venture to say it's a home for artists to put their own work in its own context with itself um, in the context of solo exhibitions and then also for that to engage a larger public. Um, and that larger public, I think, needs to be uh, further programmed, um, I, would, I would venture to say. I think you're seeing that in the museums where there's you know, massive over-programming of the museum. There's a lot of pressure to do that, to stay relevant. Um, and gallerists have to think about, is that the role that they want to take in keeping the gallery space relevant? Or do they want to invent other forms of bringing in that discourse? Um, because it's that's the most creative space for discussion. It, you have the luxury of time. Um, you're not in a massive public space. You get to have your own individual relationship with work, and, and I'm a big advocate for that. Well, with regards to the two-client system, those are the two clients to which you have an obligation to sort of keep in constant contact with. Um, other clients or other visitors to the gallery include critics, who would rather just be left alone. And uh, of course, curators, but I consider when you're talking with a curator, they fall into the same category as collectors. You're sort of interested in them doing something with your artists. As far as the general public, um, I think the general public comes and goes to galleries as, as the work in them is interested to them. I don't know that I've ever tailored a show so that it would attract the general public. I think we're doing something a little more specific than that. But. That's a good point. There was another question in the back. Is that, is that person still here? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Mary Spirito, and um, I came here to see to hear this talk because I thought that the this advent of the mega galleries and how it affects everything else, whether they exist or don't exist, now they exist, was um, is sort of interesting because we don't really know what to do, but I'd like you guys to sort of talk about that more. Like, if there wasn't these mega galleries, would you do things differently now that they are? How specifically you're responding to that context um, in addition to all the other stuff? Please, thank you. Thanks, Mary. That's a, that's a great question. Um, from, from my perspective and just also in discussion with other colleagues, um, who are doing independent, we discussed this there a lot as well, um, how, to, how to navigate the climate when you feel that um, you're getting squeezed and that the liberation of artists being able to have choices becomes even more significant. Um, and I talk about, we talk about this a little bit in the interview yeah. that we did in preparation for this talk. Um, there really has to be uh, more of a growth with the artists at each milestone, small milestone of their time with the gallery. So it's not just about getting to a, a really major level and then having a discussion about, well, how do you feel if, if a mega gallery comes in and tries to work with you? How should we handle that? This is, these are discussions that you have to have from day one. Um, when, I, when I'm working, embarking on a, a relationship with an artist, I, I say, look, this is a joint venture. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is going to be a nurturing environment, but we define what those terms are. And, you know, how do you feel about the climate? Um, how do you feel about longevity? What's your relationship to a narrative with a gallery? Those conversations happen now, I think, for, from my perspective, from day one, because to know philosophically where an artist is will help define the roadmap. Um, and I think also allowing for more freedom uh, at each stage of the process is becoming increasingly important for us. 
Um, actually, Mary, would you mind just rephrasing the last part of your question, or just, can, do you still have a thing? Could you just ask that one more time? I'm sorry. So make sure I get it exactly right. Just, um, just to kind of come back to that topic, that, um, you know, how is it changing the decisions you're making about how you're handling things, whether it's with your artists or your, you know, other dealers and curators? Because um, it's like this new animal, how do you... Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm hearing a lot more sort of emerging and mid-level galleries talk about contracts than ever before. Uh, when we started our gallery about 10 years ago, contracts were something that most galleries didn't want to deal with. And especially emerging artists were a little nervous about them, so we didn't use them very much. Uh, but if, you know, we're moving to a place where there is, and we haven't said this yet, but I think there's a lot of pressure on the mega galleries. Um, I think, you know, they have these tremendous overheads and they need artists who can sort of support this and hopefully they're supporting them in return and everything. But um, what I think it changes fundamentally for some of the galleries that I respect the most is their willingness to invest in artists in a way that would only pay off over the long term. Mm -hmm. Meaning giving them shows where there's no chance of selling necessarily in this one show, but it creates an important foundation for the context of their work or you know, taking risks in other ways um, that you would only have done if you thought that this was a very long term relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think that then starts to change the type of art and the types of projects that galleries are willing to do and so I, I, you know, I'm a little concerned that there's not some other platform or institution to kind of step in and provide not only the nurturing, but the laboratory, the experimental side of things. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question I think exactly. the more we talk about it um, in an open forum like this, which is a wonderful opportunity to open up these questions, um, I think the more confidence gallerists will have to open up these topics with their artists. Yeah. Um, because it, it makes so much sense as things progress that, that there be more emancipation from the gallery w in line with growth. I think a lot of artists go to mega galleries because they want to have the autonomy and the freedom. Um, it's a, there's a perceived freedom uh, when you aren't in that very, very intimate relationship that you have, which is a great partnership, but it's still a relationship. Um, so it, th there have to be other things that are introduced along the way that provide um, a sense of that autonomy and also the support to have both in tandem and a balance, I think is really the key issue. So we have time for one or two more questions. There's, we'll work geographically. Alan, we'll have time for yours. Hi, my name is Andrea from Christina de Mayo in Zurich. My question would be, do you feel there's a difference between mega galleries in the States and mega galleries in Europe or Latin America or even Asia? You want to take that question, John? That's a good question. It's hard to know from a distance what's net mega. I mean, for years I'd see these galleries doing big, sh big ads of famous artists, then you go there in Europe and it's like the size of my closet with two people there. And I said, oh, that's how they can do this. You know, so I think it's hard to know because unless you've actually been in those locations to see what's going on and uh, there, there might be, it's just. Well, we knew when we first started talking, this would be a very New York point of view for this topic. And so um, I'm, actually curious, do you think that there's a difference between the mega galleries in Europe and the mega galleries in New York? What well, a huge difference. And would it relate to sort of uh, their ambition or would it relate to the way they work with artists or what's the main? So what she's, what she's saying is that yes, there, so there is a big there difference. Is, and I think it's because of different cultural backgrounds. Because I heard like the role of galleries, does it need it anymore, etc. I think in, or at least in very tiny Switzerland it does, and all these new spaces jump up because artists come together, young people say, let's open a gallery, let's show, without even thinking of, 
are we professional? Do we make money? Sure. Can we sell? Etc. It comes out of a natural flow. And then on a certain extent, you have to start calculating. I think more, it's more organic here. I think, I don't know, in New York. So. It's very organic. The Lower East Side, a new gallery pops up almost every week. Um, there, there's no lack of the romance or the sort of like, you know, let's get a space and open a gallery. That, that's continued to happen. I don't think that, that will be um, necessarily affected by the mega galleries. Um, well, our mega galleries, for example, in Zurich, are very nice to the younger galleries and they support us in various things, which is very nice. Is that the same in the States? I mean, it's, it's, that's actually a very important point. Um, in New York, the gallery community is very supportive. I mean, you know, we can sit here and we can talk about, oh, the mega gallery, and I know that has a tinge of, oh, they're sort of evil with mustaches and tying you up on a railroad. Uh, the truth of the matter is, the galleries in New York are fantastically supportive of the mid-level galleries, and there was nothing to demonstrate that more clearly than the way they responded when a lot of mid-level galleries got completely wiped out by the hurricane. I mean, the ADAA came to the rescue of a lot of mid-level galleries, and I think very specifically because they see the importance of the whole gallery system, and because, quite frankly, they're just really nice people. Uh, but So there is support, and I don't think the competition necessarily um, means that they're not being nice. I, again, like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of pressure on these mega galleries. So We have one last question, then we have to wrap it up, I think, uh, up front. This way. He had his hand up first. Try to make a question we can answer quickly, Alan. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned about the necessity of uh, galleries working closer together. Um, that's, I think, that definitely something very obvious because there's a polarization between the bigs and the thing, and they're not against each other. They've got just different needs. And, um, and so, and we're still in a very individualistic world on, on the side of the gallery. So what kind of, of um, evolution you see on that point? You think efforts are made practically to kind of a creative, a forum of discussion only, even to discuss the relationship between artists and galleries when they leave the galleries, standardization of some kind of contract, standardization of attitude. Because it's, it's still, a, it is becoming an industry, but it's got no, absolutely no rules, no regula not regulators in the good sense of it, not the bad sense. So yeah, yeah, what yeah. do you think are the steps, or what would be the forum um, that would develop in that direction? In 30 seconds. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more, Alain. I mean, you've written about it so much, and I've really appreciated what you've, the thoughts that you've provided as, as a collector on that topic. Um, we definitely need uh, really more cohesion in terms of the discussion. Um, you know, Independent has been a great forum to begin. It's happening informally at Independent. Um, there's been discussion about uh, really creating a, a sense of a cohesion of best practices um, that could be discussed between the, the artists and the gallery relationship and evolving that, and also larger levels of collaboration because, and it's complicated because you have incredibly visionary people who are uh, extraordinarily independent running galleries that are doing some of the most significant work in culture, often sharing artists. They're, so they're collaborators in one sense, but they're competitors in another sense. Um, so it, it's a complex question. And I think that um, something has to happen where we move into a more um, uh, ambitious uh, and you know, thought-provoking um, movement to, to allow for spaces where people can come together in a more formalized way, do more collaborations, and develop more. Uh, systematically toward a, perhaps a new model. And that's where we have to leave it. So thank you for getting what's yeah. one of the most important topics out there in a very honest way. Thank you for having us. I think that this conversation is actually a part of what Elaine was asking though. This is a brilliant thing. So thank you for organizing thank you, this. Josh. Thank you for thank coming you. everybody. Thank you.